Good afternoon, everybody. Next few lectures, we're going to start going through the replicative cycle. Now, you remember we, on the second lecture, we put up a replication cycle. We divide it into steps to try and study it. And what we're going to do now is go through each of these steps uh, in one session each and try and explain what's going on. And again, I can't go through every virus, and there would be no point in doing that. What I want to do is give you an overview teach you some principles. Today we're going to start with attachment and entry, the first step in the replicative cycle. And we're going to use some viruses as examples. Viruses, as you know, are obligate intracellular parasites. That was the definition I gave you on the first day. They have to get inside of a cell. There's no way around it. If they don't get inside of a cell, they will not replicate. And here's a replicative cycle first thing that has to happen is attachment to a cell surface receptor and entry of the virus into the cell. Viruses are too big to just diffuse through the membrane. You know, there are many ways of molecules getting into cells, but viruses uh, can't just diffuse and they have to use transport pathways that exist uh, in the cell. So today we're going to focus on the first step attachment and then how the genome is brought into the cell. Viruses are floating around, not only in the air, but once they get into you, they float around and bump into various cells. Uh, they, they bump into a lot of garbage and they get inactivated. Um, and the initial interactions have no specificity. They'll bump into a cell and it's not the right cell because it doesn't have a receptor, so they'll come off perhaps and move around. But eventually they will find a cell with a receptor on it and attach to that. So that's what we're going to talk about today. There can be more than one receptor, and I'm always talking about the cell receptor, and you'll see sometimes I'll mention receptor and co-receptor. It doesn't minimize the importance of that second receptor protein by calling it a co-receptor. So we get a nonspecific binding, specific binding to a receptor, and then the genome is transferred inside of the cell. And where that happens depends on the configuration of the genome. And you'll see a little bit about that today, but more as we explore the initial steps in gene expression of these viruses. Now, cell receptors are needed for all viruses that infect mammals and most other animals, except for viruses that infect yeasts. There are some uh, viruses and yeasts that don't actually have extracellular phases. They replicate inside the yeast, and then when the yeast divide, they go from cell to cell. So they don't need to worry about getting into a new cell. And plant viruses, viruses that infect plants, they don't bind to receptors. There are no receptors in the plant cell wall. These viruses get into the cell by, by damage. So it can be a vector, an aphid, or some other insect biting uh, the plant and putting the virus in, or uh, mechanical damage. Farmers running over plants, the tractors break the leaves, and the tractors are contaminated, they get inside. Okay, so. With those exceptions, all viruses need receptors to get into cells. This is a really new field. As of 1985, only one receptor was known, which was for influenza virus, a sugar called sialic acid, which we'll talk about today. But since then, the field has exploded. We know lots of virus receptors. And that's due to technology, basically, monoclonal antibody technology, the ability to make monoclonals against a specific epitope on a protein and also recombinant DNA technology has spurred that on. Now, as you know, the plasma membrane of a cell is full of all sorts of molecules. It has lots of transmembrane proteins, GPI-linked proteins, carbohydrates, and so forth. And these all have functions for the cell. Some of them are, are virus receptors. And viruses have evolved to utilize or bind to specific molecules on the surface of the cell. These receptors do not exist for the virus, okay? They were there first, the cell needs them, they're essential molecules, and it happens that the viruses have uh, evolved to bind to them and utilize them. So many people feel that these are there for viruses, but that would be silly. It would be like giving a, a key to something with a lot of uh, wealth in it to, to your robber. Here are some examples of virus receptors on the bottom here. It's just a handful, there are many, many more. Uh, you can see they're all different types, ranging from heparin sulfate, uh, proteoglycan, to sialic acids, which we'll talk about today, gangliosides, 
and then a variety of transmembrane proteins, as you can see here. And these are some of the viruses that uh, bind to them. And some of the ones we'll be talking about uh, include HIV-1 and influenza virus uh, binding to sialic acids. As you can see, they're all different configurations. And again, they have functions in the cell. This is the low-density lipoprotein receptor, LDLR. It's important for the transport of cholesterol uh, in us. Integrins, CD4, chemokine receptors. These are all proteins with functions in the immune system but viruses have evolved to bind to them. So we're gonna look at this process in some detail today. A few more general facts. First of all, sometimes different viruses can bind the same receptor. I suppose there are only a certain number of cell surface proteins and there are probably far more viruses, so that, that's inevitable. Uh, one of them is adenovirus and Coxsackie virus. They, they bind a common receptor. Um, and these are two very different viruses. Adenovirus, I think you've already seen, is the icosahedral virus with the fibers sticking out, looking like a satellite. Coxsackie virus is related to polio. It's an icosahedral RNA-containing virus, yet they bind a common receptor. Uh, by the way, Coxsackie virus is named after a town in upstate New York, Coxsackie, where it was first isolated. Uh, exit 21B off the, what is it, the New York State Thruway. I took that picture once while I was driving. Don't do this. <laughs> I was holding the camera up because I had to get this for my classes and I've been using it ever since. Coxsackie, New York. Um, a herpes virus of pigs, pseudorabies virus binds the same receptor as poliovirus. And sometimes, even within the same family, viruses bind different receptors. So there are over 150 rhinovirus genotypes and they bind to three different kinds of receptors. Retroviruses, as we'll see, uh, bind to 16, at least 16 different receptors. So lots of variation on the receptor theme. It's not just one receptor uh, for a given virus. Now I want to divide um, our, our consideration of virus entry into roughly two areas. First we're going to talk about icosahedral viruses like poliovirus here on the upper left, which we talked about last time. How these attach to cells and how the genome gets out. It's kind of an interesting problem because Remember, I told you that they are quite stable, these, uh, p these viruses with icosahedral capsids. So, and they're, they're rather smooth, they're spherical. So how do they attach to a receptor and how does the genome get out? And then we're going to talk about envelope viruses, which have glycoproteins in the envelope, which is a little easier to imagine how they might interact with the receptors. You have this glycoprotein uh, sticking out and that's attaching to the cell receptor. And we'll also talk about how the genome gets out of those because they have a membrane around them. So what is the process there? And they're different. They're different processes from, from these icosahedral viruses to the envelope viruses. So let's start with some icosahedral built viruses. Poliovirus on the top. Uh, shown in this image is, which I showed last time as well, a cryo-electron micrograph. This is actually the x-ray crystallographic version, it's the virus bound to its cellular receptor. So the cellular receptor is a molecule called CD155. It's shown in a cartoon over here on the upper right. It's a transmembrane glycoprotein, uh, and its distal domain binds to the poliovirus capsid, which is shown in cross-section up on the upper right here. Here's the five-fold axis of symmetry. Around the five-fold axis, there's a groove in the particle you can't really see it here. There's no depth to these images, but there's a groove surrounding the five-fold axis, which is uh, on this left image right at the center of the blue area, and the receptors are binding into that groove. So here is one example of how a smooth particle can bind a receptor. It's not actually smooth. It's got little depressions into which the receptors bind. Now you see there are one, two, three, four, five receptors bound around the five-fold axis, which makes perfect sense, right? Because there are five copies of the protein around the five-fold axis. It happens to be called VP1. So if there's a receptor binding site there, they're going to be five copies. If it were binding at the three-fold axis, you might predict there are three copies and, and so forth. So that's one example the, the receptor can bind into a little groove on the capsid. A little bit of a different approach is shown by rhinoviruses on the lower left. These are in the same family as polio. They're structurally very similar, genetically very similar. Uh, rhinoviruses also have a groove around the five-fold axis. You can actually see it in this projection. This five-fold axis right at the top of panel C, okay, 
uh, you can just see the beginning of a groove on the left side there. It encircles the whole fivefold axis. That's, that's the groove into which the polio receptor binds on polio. But this is rhinovirus, and as you can see, the receptor shown in gray is not binding in that groove. It's actually sitting down on this flat area at the five-fold axis. The receptor for these, this particular rhinovirus is low-density lipoprotein receptor. And that's, there, there it is shown there in its, its structure. And there are five copies of it bound to the surface uh, at the five-fold axis. We call this the, the plateau or the mesa. It's just a, if you know what a mesa is, you've been out to the southwest of the US, these big rock formations with steep cliffs and a flat top. Well, that's what this looks like. And so uh, it, this receptor is just binding to the surface. So you don't even need a groove for a receptor molecule to bind to these icosahedral capsids. They can just sit on the surface of the particle. And again, these are not covalent interactions right, between the receptor and the virus. They're non-covalent of various sorts, uh, but they're sufficient to have pretty good affinity. And part of the reason is that you have multiple receptors binding to the virus. Now you remember, these receptors are stuck in the cell membrane. For illustrations, we've simplified things in, and just shown the receptors here without the cell membrane. So that's two examples of how icosahedral viruses bind. Now adenovirus is also uh, a virus built with icosahedral symmetry in the center. You can see it. We, we talked about this last time. There's an electron micrograph on the right. And it has these wonderful fibers uh, at each five-fold axis of symmetry. And at the tip of each fiber uh, is a knob-like projection. The fiber is a trimer of three polypeptides. So you can see there are three uh, knob-like ends on each fiber. And for adenovirus, that is the part of the virus that attaches to the cell receptor. The cell receptor happens to be a very nicely named molecule called the Coxsackie adenovirus receptor, or CAR, uh, because it's also bound by Coxsackie viruses. And what happens is this fiber binds to the surface of CAR. So on the left, we're looking down at uh, the CAR molecule. It's in the lighter color blue in the background. And the fiber, the tip of the knob of the fiber, these are the three subunits in blue and, and uh, red and yellow, sitting down on CAR. So we're looking right down on the uh, vertical axis of the fiber and the CAR molecules into underneath. So that's how the fiber knob interacts with CAR. It simply sits down in the middle of the protein. Again, non-covalent interactions. So this is a this is a structure that doesn't need to be there. Right? An icosahedral capsid could by itself bind to a receptor, like I've shown you for polio and rhino, but it, it has evolved to be this way. And, and again, that's one of those extra proteins on, on the shell that are not part of the symmetry of the icosahedron, but which serve other functions, in this case, binding uh, to a cellular receptor. So those are two examples of how an icosahedral virus binds to a receptor. Either the receptors bind right on the surface of the capsid, or you have these fibers, as with adenovirus, that, that can bind to the receptor. Now let's look at an envelope virus. We'll look at influenza virus. Again, this is a virus with a helical, a helical nucleocapsid, right? RNA protein uh, complexes inside, and these are wrapped up in a helix like I showed you the other day. And they're surrounded by a membrane, which is shown in a kind of uh, light, light brown or gray color. And in the membrane is embedded the spikes, are embedded the spikes because there are two. There's a hemagglutinin shown in uh, purple and the neuraminidase in uh, orange. The hemagglutinin is the receptor binding glycoprotein of this virus. So envelope viruses, conceptually, a little easier to see how they attach the receptors. We can have these glycoproteins sticking out. And that's one of the main functions of these spike glycoproteins, as we call them. So for influenza virus, we're showing the virus attaching to a cell surface. And the hemagglutinin is mediating attachment uh, to cellular receptors. And the membrane is starting to bend in in anticipation of this virus getting into the cell. Now, what is the receptor for influenza virus? For, uh, polio, rhino, and adenovirus, these were protein receptors, transmembrane proteins on the surface of the cell. But it is also for influenza virus, a protein receptor. But what actually attaches to the virus is a carbohydrate. And it's sialic acid. Now, on the surface of cells, of course, there are glycoproteins, that is, transmembrane proteins, to which sugar chains or oligosaccharides are covalently linked. And 
these, these monomer, monomeric sugars, shown as spheres here, can be any, any of the individual uh, six carbon sugar rings, like galactose, or they can be salic acid. And salic acid, when present on a glycoprotein on the sugar chain, is always the last sugar for reasons that we don't know. It's always the last sugar. So they're shown here in yellow, the red arrows. That's sialic acid here, and it's shown linked to galactose as the second uh, sugar residue in this chain. So that is the receptor for influenza, that sugar. As I'll show you in a moment, the hemagglutinin wraps itself around that sugar molecule. The rest, uh, the, the rest of the sugar makes a little bit of a difference, but it doesn't seem like the protein to which it's attached really matters. In fact, the virus can bind to sialic acids themselves, and they seem to attach to sialic acids on any, sugar, on any protein on the cell surface. Now, the way that the first sugar, salic acid, is attached to the second one, influences what kind of uh, influenza viruses <coughs> will attach. So uh, here in the diagram, I've shown sialic acid attached to galactose via a 2-3 linkage. So the carbons are linked via this oxygen, the number 2 and the number 3 carbon. So we call that uh, an alpha 2-3 uh, linkage right here, alpha 2-3. Uh, they can also, influenza viruses also recognize salic acids linked by an alpha-2-6 linkage. There's the number six carbon right there. The alpha-2-6 linked salic acids are preferentially bound by human influenza virus strains, the ones that infect us. And in contrast, alpha-2-3 salic acids are preferentially bound by avian strains. So if you've heard of the dreaded H5N1 avian influenza virus, this virus prefers alpha-2-3 salic acids. In our respiratory tract, the alpha-2-3 linked sialic acids are way down in the bottom, way at the lower ends of the tract. We'll, sh we'll look at this later in a pathogenesis uh, discussion. Uh, so in order for these viruses to infect you, you have to inf inhale them very deeply because there are no alpha-2-3s uh, alpha in the upper tract, whereas the human influenza viruses that prefer alpha-2-6, the alpha-2-6s are distributed in the upper and lower tract so those viruses have no problems infecting us. So this is a very interesting problem of, of how a receptor governs, what kind of viruses we're buying, and we will get back to it when we talk about uh, the, the threat of avian influenza viruses infecting people. Here is the three-dimensional structure of the hemagglutinin of influenza virus on the left. So here's the viral membrane at the bottom. Uh, the, the protein is inserted into the membrane. It's a transmembrane protein. And then it consists of, an al of a highly alpha helical stalk. You can see the, al the alpha helic content is quite high here. And then a globular head. So that's why in the images we draw a globular head and a very long stalk. It's based on the three-dimensional structure. At the very top on, of the globular head, there is a groove. It's right there on the upper left. It's expanded to the right, and now we're looking down on the molecule along its axis. And there is the, the sialic acid binding site. So in green is a residue of sialic acid, and it's shown making various interactions with amino acids uh, in the head of the hemagglutinin. So this is how the hemagglutinin recognizes the sialic acid. It's only the sialic acid it's attaching to, and not the rest of the protein, even though the linkage does influence uh, how it's attaching. All right, so this was one of the first uh, details that we obtained of a virus receptor, a virus glycoprotein binding to its cellular receptor, exactly how it works. And you'll see later that some of the drugs, that, antiviral drugs that you can take to prevent influenza actually mimic sialic acid, not binding to this protein, but a different protein on the virus. So that's influenza virus. Let's look at another envelope virus, an important one that we'll talk about a lot human immunodeficiency virus type 1, which is a retrovirus. It's diagrammed here on the left. Uh, its genome uh, consists of a plus strand of RNA that is copied to a DNA when it infects the cell. This virus also has an envelope around it, and it has in the envelope glycoproteins stuck in. And this is, this, there's a single glycoprotein for HIV in contrast to an influenza virus, and that, of course, would be what attaches to the cellular receptor. The cellular receptor for, there are actually two receptors for HIV. Uh, one of them is CD4, which is a protein on the present of CD4 T lymphocytes. And that's diagrammed uh, 
Uh, in the middle is the structure of CD4 uh, in brown, and it's cartooned on the right, CD4. And on top in red is the part of the glycoprotein of uh, HIV-1 that binds CD4. And uh, this is called SU for surface. Uh, it's not the entire glycoprotein. It's just the part that binds CD4. And you can see how it interacts with the CD4 molecule, kind of wrapping around it. And there's a tyrosine uh, amino acid on CD4 right there that binds in a cavity of uh, the glycoprotein of the virus. And this is important for the interaction. If you change that to another amino acid, the, the affinity of the binding goes way down. So here, it's the, the glycoprotein is binding to a protein not a sugar as for influenza virus, but the principles are the same. All right, let's take a, a question here. All right, the question is, viral receptors on the cell surface. One, can bind directly to icosahedral virus capsid proteins. Two, interact with glycoproteins of envelope viruses. Three, can be carbohydrate or protein molecules. Four, have cellular functions. And five, all of the above. So 97% of you said all of the above, which is the correct answer. All of these things are right. 3% um, of you who said interact with glycoproteins. It's, it's true, but everything else is true as well. So you have to watch when there's an all of the above. Let's talk, all right, so we've talked about virus attachment in very broad strokes. Let's talk about entry into the cell because that's the next step. Cells have mechanisms to bring molecules into uh, the interior. Uh, cells can do phagocytosis of big particles. We don't think this really works for viruses, um, so we're not going to talk about that anymore, but the processes on the right, pinocytosis, by which the membrane of a cell kind of ruffles up and captures solutes in the extracellular space and then brings them into vesicles. That might be one way that viruses get into cells, but the most common route, as at least we think, is by receptor-mediated endocytosis. So the cell has a pathway by which uh, receptors on the cell surface will bind ligands like growth factors and take them into the cell uh, by endocytosis and bring them into the interior. And that's the pathway that many viruses have uh, evolved to utilize. Now when we talk about this pathway, I just want you to remember that things don't just diffuse in the cytoplasm because it's a really crowded space. This is a wonderful illustration. Uh, of uh, the crowded cytoplasm, starting from the plasma membrane up here, which apparently has trees on it, green trees, and moving below, there's an actin filament network right below the plasma membrane, and you can't just move through that. Viruses have to disrupt it. So many viruses binding their receptors <coughs> signal a loosening of this actin network. And then you go down below, there are ribosomes in here, there are microtubular networks, here we can move down again. You've got some endoplasmic reticulum. Uh, and now we're moving toward the nucleus in the third panel. There's a nuclear pore and things going through it. And then, of course, the nucleus is packed too. All the um, nucleosomes are shown there. So movement of viruses in the cell occurs by motors that are linked to these uh, microtubular and actin networks. All right, so remember this. It's, by, it's not by diffusion. Movement of viruses is through very directed processes, which some of which are shown on this slide. This is a very nice summary of all the different ways that we know of that viruses can get into cells. And let's look at a couple of them in detail. Uh, you see here on the left uh, two viruses that are fusing right at the plasma membrane. So these are envelope viruses. There's an icosahedral virus with an envelope or a uh, helical virus with an envelope. They're both fusing at the cell surface. We'll talk about how that works in a moment. And then in the case of the helical virus, the genome ends up in the cytoplasm right there. So it's already entered. The fusion at the cell surface releases it. For this um, icosahedral particle, now the capsid is now in the cytoplasm. And for this particular virus, it's a DNA virus. It has to get its genome into the nucleus. So as I said, that capsid is not going to just diffuse. It would take too long. It actually moves along the microtubule network by motor proteins that transport it. So it's able to interact those. It's transported all the way down to uh, the nucleus. And there it can dock and put its genome into the nucleus. So again, where viruses go depend on the genomes. DNA viruses typically want to go uh, into the nucleus. So those are surface entry pathways. And then the rest are a variety of different <laughs> types of receptor-mediated endocytic pathways. So here, 
on the upper left is clathrin dependent endocytosis. It's so called because as uh, a particle binds to receptors, it's taken up uh, into a coated pit, a pit coated with clathrin, which are these little triskelion molecules here. And then uh, this moves into the cell. Uh, it becomes an endosome, an early endosome, and a late endosome, and eventually becomes, uh, fuses with lysosomes. And again, these are transported uh, to the interior of the cell by motor proteins that move along the tracks of microtubules. And many envelope viruses enter by endocytosis, not just clathrin dependent, but also endocytosis, but clathrin independent endocytosis as shown here, caviolin dependent. They're all involving viruses being taken up into endosomes and moving into the cell. And you can see the genome is released in various ways. We're gonna talk about how that works in a moment. The key here is that different mechanisms of uptake occur and that the movement within the cell is not simply by diffusion. So here's a, here's a nice movie of how an endosome is pulled along a microtubule by the dynein motor. There it is. This is a nice uh, animation by an artist. And, the, and within the cell you have lots of these microtubule tracks and that's how vesicles, endocytic vesicles, move around just like that. Well, I don't know if it, it looks like a human walking, right? So this is a little bit of artistic license. But you know, the the motor proteins are attached to the endosome. Sometimes they can be attached to virus particles. We know that this interaction is specific, and that's how they move into a cell. All right. So let's talk a little bit about uh, virus entry at the cell surface, uh, which happens for a number of viruses, and figure out how this happens. Now remember from last time, viruses are metastable. That means as they're floating around, they're very stable, but at some trigger, they have to become unstable and give up the genome. So what the discussion we're going to have now is going to keep this in mind. What's the trigger for making the virus unstable, uncoding the genome? So at the top is an image of a paramyxomyris like measles virus uh, binding to a receptor on the cell surface. And then the membrane of the virus fuses with that of the cell surface and the genome is right in the cytoplasm. How does that work? This has to be regulated. And this is another theme I want you to keep track of. This is a process called fusion of the virus and the cell membrane. Fusion <coughs> has to be regulated because viruses can't be fusing wherever they are, right? They, they would fuse with each other. They would fuse with the wrong cell. So something has to regulate it. I'm going to tell you what that is. In this case, for this measles-like virus, it's interaction with a cell receptor. There are two uh, glycoproteins on the surface of this measles virus. They're diagrammed in panel B. One is called HN and the other is called F. The HN is like the hemagglutinin of influenza virus. It's the receptor attachment protein. Uh, so it's shown in this third panel attaching to uh, a receptor on the cell surface, which is colored red. OK, so that's fine to attach the virus. The second protein is very important. It's the F in the name of this protein stands for fusion protein. And this protein is going to catalyze the fusion of the cell in the viral membrane. Normally, on the virus particle, this fusion protein is folded over. And the function of that is to hide a short amino acid sequence at the end terminus, called F2, to hide that from any membranes that the virus might encounter. So it's buried on the surface of the particle. This 30 or so amino acid sequence is very hydrophobic. And when it gets near a membrane, it sticks in it and catalyzes fusion. When this virus binds to its cell receptor, that binding transmits a conformational change to the fusion peptide, to the fusion protein, so that the fusion peptide is now flipped out, it's exposed, it buries itself in the cell membrane, and now the virus and the cell membrane can get very close together and they can fuse. And this involves additional movements of the proteins, as you'll see for, in some other examples later on. So the way the fusion is regulated is by requiring a specific uh, glycoprotein receptor interaction to occur. Otherwise, the fusion protein is not uh, exposed, the fusion peptide is not exposed, and fusion can't occur. On the bottom is what happens with HIV-1. Now, HIV-1 is an example of a virus envelope with glycoprotein that requires two receptors, and it's a way of controlling fusion. Here is HIV-1. Uh, diagram, and there is its glycoprotein. It just has one kind of glycoprotein in the membrane, and it's composed of a transmembrane segment 
called TM for transmembrane, and that's actually got a fusion peptide in its end terminus, which is hidden just like the fusion peptide of the paramyxovirus. It's folded back against the viral membrane. Non-covalently attached to TM is another subunit of the glycoprotein called SU for surface. I showed you a picture of this binding to, to CD4 previously. When this virus attaches to its cellular receptor, it initially binds via the SU to the CD4 molecule on a T cell. CD4 is shown in green here. That uh, binding is not enough to get virus entry. You need to interact with the second receptor, which is a chemokine receptor, CCR shown here uh, in purple in the cell membrane. So this virus needs two receptors. When it first binds CD4, the conformation of SU changes, and it is now able to bind the chemokine receptor. It cannot bind the chemokine receptor until it first binds CD4. You need both of those interactions to then make a conformational change in, in the TM, flip out the fusion peptide so that it now inserts into the cell membrane. Okay, so two ways to regulate fusion, one by requiring a single uh, receptor ligand interaction and the second to require two. In both cases, you need those interactions to expose the fusion peptide. So that's how fusion is regulated at the cell surface. You'll see other ways of doing this in the interior of the cell. So here's a, an animation of HIV about to infect a CD4 positive T cell in the blood. These are red blood cells. And here on the surface of the CD4 positive cell we have the CD4 receptor and the chemokine receptor uh, here in yellow and the virus is going to attach uh, first to CD4. Now the density of glycoproteins on the HIV is very low compared to flu. You can see there are lots of spaces. So here is the, uh, the TM portion of the glycoprotein. Here's the SU portion. And the fusion peptide is folded back uh, against the viral membrane. And these glycoproteins exist as <laughs> trimers, so they're going to interact with three CD4 molecules. That exposes a high affinity binding site on SU, so now it can interact uh, with the chemokine receptor. And uh, that will release the fusion peptide. Artists decided to get rid of everything else for clarity, but now the fusion peptide is going into the cell membrane, and fusion can occur. In order for fusion to occur, uh, this now elongated TM segment is going to bend again. Getting memories to fuse is, is not so hard. You just have to bring them very close together and get rid of all the, excuse me, water molecules in between. And so this molecule is going to bend and that's going to bring the, the two membranes together. And it's shown in this animation as well. So now we're looking at a trimer of the, that TM segment. And here is the viral membrane, the cell membrane. Okay, they're already inserted into both. You watch what happens here to bring the membranes together. This is going to change conformation. It's going to assume an alpha helical uh, conformation, and that would bring up the viral to the cell membrane. All right, so it's a really neat, first we, we have the, that's the way the virus exists normally in that folded conformation. Uh, th when it binds the receptors, the Fusion peptides extended into the cell membrane, it's reversed here, uh, and then they refold to get the membranes close together. So that's a pretty neat uh, approximation. I think we're going to go a little further here. So now we're getting the what we call hairpinning. The, the TM is folding back up. The two membranes are being brought really close together. And when you do that, when they touch, essentially the water molecules are gone. They can fuse uh, spontaneously. First, the inner leaflet fuses, as you can see here. This is a, a well-known intermediate in membrane fusion. It's called hemifusion because uh, only the outer leaflets of the cell and viral membrane are fused. But obviously, you need to get this one uh, fused as well, and that'll make a pore, and that's the next step. A lot of this we don't quite understand, uh, but that, that first fusion, the hemifusion, is quite clear that it requires just an apposition of the membrane. So now the other leaflets have fused, and you can get transport of the viral contents uh, into the cell interior. So those movies, there are links to those movies. They're pretty neat websites with all sorts of um, molecular animations as well. Which of the following does not play a 
role in virus entry. It does not. Clathrin mediated endocytosis, fusion of viral and cellular, viral and plasma membranes, diffusion of virus particles in the cytoplasm, microtubule mediated transport, and lysosomes. <laughs> fusion of virus particles in the cytoplasm is not, <laughs> is not a uh, part of virus uh, entry. Now, a lot of you said lysosomes, um, but in the very first among the first slides where I had a cell with all the ways of virus is getting in, I mentioned that the endocytic pathway ends up in lysosomes. I didn't say that that was important for virus entry, so I can understand why you might get that wrong. But it absolutely plays a role uh, in virus entry, as you'll, you'll see. Let's talk about uh, influenza virus entry. So the HIV, which we animated, all this hap is thought to happen on the cell surface. So the only triggers for fusion are the interaction of the virus glycoprotein with receptor, but it's different for influenza virus. So influenza viruses bind sialic acids, and they're taken up into the cell by the endocytic pathway. But the binding alone is not enough to trigger fusion. Something else has to happen, and that other event is low pH. Uh, you may know that in the normal pathway of endosomes entering cells, as they move from the plasma membrane to, towards the nucleus, they acidify. The pH of the endosome interior drops. And that's because there are pumps in the endosome membrane that pump protons from the cytoplasm into the endosome, and that drops the pH. So we're talking about from about neutral to six or five and a half. That's enough to catalyze a fusion reaction that's going to occur. So as the endosome pH drops to a critical point, the influenza virus hemagglutinin, which is bound to sialic acid. Here are the globular heads that are bound to sialic acid. Uh, there's the part of the protein inserted into the membrane. Uh, the protein starts to undergo a conformational change. Now, what I want you to look at, right down at the base of the HA, just before the transmembrane segments, there are, this is a trimer. So there are three fusion peptides. And there, there are cylinders with a little black curly Q at the end. That's the fusion peptide, which is equivalent to the fusion of HIV and, and the paramyxoviruses that we just discussed. It's hidden because, again, you don't want it to be fusing randomly with any membrane that the virus encounters. But as soon as the pH reaches a certain point, the whole protein undergoes a conformational change, and these fusion proteins flip up towards the cell membrane. You can see now in the third panel, they are inserted into the cell membrane. There are the fusion peptides go right into the cellular membrane. And then the whole construct bends, just like the TM of HIV. It bends or hairpins. It brings the two, uh, the cell and the endosome membranes together, and then they can fuse and let the viral genome out. So that's that is illustrated up here. So here, the, here are two hemagglutinin molecules. The fusion peptide is inserted into the cell membrane. Starting, they're starting to bend and bring down the membranes. Uh, you get hemifusion and then complete fusion, just like uh, for HIV. Right. So now the endosome uh, interior is open, and the ribonucleoproteins, the, icos uh, sorry, the helical capsid of influenza virus can get out. And that has to actually go in the nucleus. It's unusual for an RNA virus, so we're showing it going uh, through the nuclear pore here. So here, low pH is the key for fusion. It's regulated by the necessity of having uh, low pH. <coughs> The, this is a structure of the intermediates of the hemagglutinin showing you this conformational change. Here's the native hemagglutinin. It's a trimer. The virus membrane would be down at the base. At the top is the globular head to which sialic acid binds. And the fusion peptide is down here. Um, in the low pH state, uh, you have an extended conformation. The fusion peptides can't be seen in the structure, but they would be now at the tip of the molecule. So they go from the base of the molecule to the tip. The middle, the middle intermediate here is a cleaved version. So uh, as the um, hemagglutinin is present on virus particles as they come out of a cell, the hemagglutinin is not cleaved. Cleavage is required to make an N-terminus to expose the fusion peptide. So n otherwise, this fusion peptide would be part of a continuous polypeptide. Uh, and then the, the fusion peptides can be flipped up to the top of the molecule. If you don't have that cleavage, which is done by cell proteases, you don't get infectivity. And we'll come back to that at a later time. The influenza virus glycoprotein is called a class one 
fusion protein. It's similar in structure and function to other viral fusion proteins. Uh, these are perpendicular to the membrane. I think in the pictures of HA I've shown you, you can see that. It's mostly alpha helical, as you can see, all these alpha helicals, and they make trimers. And again, the way the fusion works uh, is at low pH, the fusion peptides are flipped from the bottom where they're hidden near the viral membrane to the top where they can insert uh, into the cellular membrane to catalyze fusion. So here's an animation of influenza virus entry, virus binding to receptors. It's taken up by endocytosis into a clathrin coated pit and then a vesicle. And these will start to move uh, into the cell. And of course, they're moving it along a microtubule track, which is great. The clathrin comes off. This is part of the normal process of endocytosis. pH is dropping. And then at some point, the fusion occurs, and the, the, the viral genome gets out uh, of the endosome and goes into the nucleus, which is shown here uh, going through the pores. Class II fusion proteins are found on some other viruses, and we've encountered these already. I showed you a picture of a Flavi virus the other day, shown on the upper right. Uh, these are also envelope viruses with glycoproteins in their membrane, but the glycoproteins lie flat on the membrane. They are parallel to the membrane, as shown on the lower left. And you can see on the upper right, these extended, this yellow and the, and the red and the blue, these are all individual glycoproteins. It's really interesting that they lie flat on the surface. These, in contrast to the class one, are mostly uh, beta sheets. They, also, they form dimers as opposed to trimers, but they're parallel to the membrane. However, at low pH, they flip up. So the fusion peptides are hidden. Here's the fusion peptide in red here and over here at the base. They're hidden so they don't fuse spontaneously. At low pH, the whole, uh, fusion, the whole protein flips up, and that puts the fusion peptides at the top where it can insert uh, into the membrane, just like influenza, but starting from a different configuration. So this is an example of a Flavi virus binding a cell and being taken up by endocytosis. <clears throat> Going to move along this microtubule track. Decided not to put clathrin on it, but they're floating around here, as you can see. There are the glycoproteins moving up. You saw them initially flat on the surface. Now they're moving up. The fusion peptides are here, sticking up. And I think we're going to have a close-up of these yeah, uh, fitting into the cell membrane. And then they're, they're going to hairpin just like the other fusion proteins that we've talked about and bring the two membranes closer together until they fuse. Virus entry really lends itself to uh, animations. There are quite a few of these. And now the viral nucleic acid is starting to pass through. You can see it here. This is a plus-stranded RNA, so this can start being translated as soon as it comes out uh, of the endosome. All right, so those, those are two ways to regulate fusion. The first one was by requiring a receptor interaction. The second one was be requiring low pH. I want to tell you a third one, which is recently discovered uh, which was found in Ebola viruses. Uh, and these, of course, are filamentous viruses. Very unusual, long, elongated shape, but these contain a membrane. Inside, there's a helical uh, genome, RNA complex with proteins. And of course, on the surface of the membrane is a glycoprotein, uh, which is responsible for attachment to cells. Here it is, glycoprotein, or GP. These viruses interact with a cell surface receptor. It hasn't really been identified. Lots of different candidates have been suggested, but there's some suggestion that uh, these viruses may be taken up by pinocytosis. Maybe they bump into the cell, and the cell makes the, the ruffles and takes them up. They're taken in by the endocytic pathway uh, during the uptake, uh, this glycoprotein. So the viral glycoprotein uh, shown here on the left is, is shown again in a larger form on the right-hand diagram. As it comes in the cell, this glycoprotein has a, has a protective mucin cap. And that's cleaved off in the endosome uh, by endosomal proteases as it moves through the endosome. And that cleavage is essential for infectivity. The next thing that happens is really unique. This uh, virus particle in the endosome with the cleaved uh, glycoprotein cap 
now binds a, a protein in the endosomal membrane. It's a multi-pass protein called NPC1. Uh, and that stands for neiman pick cholesterol transporter. neiman pick is a disease of people who lack this transporter. They can't properly sort cholesterol and they usually die uh, in their early teens, uh, between 10 and, eight, and 15 years old. Um, so from those patients, it was found that they have a defect in this, this endosomal protein. It turns out that the Ebola virus binds to it and allows fusion to occur. So this is a fusion receptor present in the endosome. And the function of removing the mucin cap from the glycoprotein <laughs> is to allow the glycoprotein to interact with NPC1. And then fusion occurs and the genome is inserted into the cytoplasm where it can then start replicating. So it's an unusual way to regulate fusion by requiring interaction with a fusion receptor in the endosome, which of course is only going to be present in the endosome. It's not going to be present anywhere else. So that's a good way of controlling fusion. One of the ways they demonstrated the requirement for MPC1 for Ebola virus entry was to get cells from patients who have the disease. They lack the protein and the virus will not infect them. But if you put the gene encoding the protein back into those cells, they now can be infected. So it's really, it's unfortunately no consolation that individuals with this disease are resistant uh, to Ebola virus entry infection. So fusion is regulated. This is a really important take home message. You don't want it to happen in the wrong place. Just think virus particles bouncing around, they could fuse with each other, they could fuse with the wrong cell. Uh, having it regulated ensures that it only happens in the right place. Sometimes it's regulated, it occurs at neutral pH at the plasma membrane as we talked about earlier, in which case you need a second protein to interact with a receptor to catalyze fusion. That's for paramyxoviruses and HIV. There's also low uh, pH fusion um, and that can happen with class two or class two transmembrane proteins which we illustrated with influenza virus and flaviviruses. Now, for influenza virus, I told you you have to have cleavage of the hemagglutinin to allow the N-terminal fusion peptide to be liberated. So proteolytic cleavage activates the fusion protein, and then when the pH drops, it goes into the membrane. If it's not cleaved, even at the low pH, it will not fuse. So it's really two checks on uh, fusion regulation, cleavage and low pH. For the flaviviruses in the class two fusion proteins, it's actually cleavage of a second protein that's needed. The second protein masks the fusion protein on the, on the virus surface, and that has to be cleaved. And then as the pH drops, the fusion protein is exposed. So you have a combination in, in the class one and class two of low pH and cleavage required for, to regulate fusion. And finally, we have a third mechanism of low pH fusion regulation to require an endosomal uh, protein in addition to low pH. So low pH for Ebola viruses does catalyze the fusion, but the virus glycoprotein has to be bound to uh, this NPC1 protein in the endosome. Viral fusion peptides are exposed for insertion into the host cell membrane when one, the virus particle is near a cell, two, the virus particle is in the cytoplasm, three, trimers of the fusion peptides form, four, the endosome becomes acidified, when five, the virus is docked onto the nuclear pore. The endosome becomes acidified is the correct answer here. Um, the virus is near a cell, it's not good enough. Just being near a cell, you have to attach to a receptor if you want to get that surface membrane fusion. Uh, being in the cytoplasm isn't enough. You have to be within an endosome uh, in the cytoplasm. Trimers uh, form, making a trimer isn't enough because in the pre-fusion conformation, these glycoproteins are trimers. So that isn't sufficient. Uh, and being docked onto the nuclear pore happens well after fusion. So it's acidification of all these is the correct answer. All right, now we've talked about the easy part, how an envelope virus gets rid of its genome. So really we talked about making an envelope virus metastable. It's a combination of receptor interaction, low pH, cleavage, sometimes a fusion receptor. Remember last time I said on the right signal in the cell, the virus becomes metastable. So those are the kinds of signals we're talking about. All right? You need multiple signals, which is a good check way to make sure that you don't fuse in the wrong place. Now let's talk about an icosahedral capsid. How does that get rid of its genome? Maybe it's not as obvious as fusion. So let's do adenovirus, which is the DNA virus, icosahedral, mm -hmm. with the fibers that bind the receptor. So here you see it's binding uh, its fiber receptor. Adenovirus actually needs two 
receptors to get into the cell, a fi interaction with a fiber receptor and then a second protein. And that's because the second protein, which is an integrin, is taken up by endocytosis. So the virus wants to get into the cell by the endocytic pathway. So here, this uh, adenovirus is being taken up uh, into a clathrin-coated kit and then an endosome. Very shortly after being taken up into the pit, the fibers start to fall off the particle. So that's like, this is the first step in disassembly of the particle. And then of course the endosome moves in towards the interior of the cell. It's moving along microtubules. It begins to acidify. And when the pH reaches a certain point, that takes about 15 minutes, the particle begins to disassemble more. So the particle is built in an acid sensitive way. It doesn't completely disassemble, it becomes partially disassembled. But uh, this, this uh, little yellow diamond shaped protein that's floating around here, you can see it's uh, in, the, in the native capsid, it's also present. This is actually a protein that pokes holes in the endosome. And that makes a hole in the endosome and, and then the virus can get out. So in the native particle, the neutral pH version of the particle, that uh, pore forming protein is buried in the capsid in such a way that it won't just make holes in any, in any membrane. It requires low pH to get it out in, in a way that will poke holes in membranes. So we have a hole in the endosome, the partially disassembled capsid comes out, it moves towards the nucleus on motor proteins again, uh, and then it docks onto the nuclear pore complex and the, and the DNA goes in the, into the nucleus. There's one more interesting mechanism that happens here. We'll talk about this at the very end. All right, so here's one way that you can uh, uncoat a nice icosahedral capsid. You can disassemble it and that's done at low pH as well. So not just membranes fuse at low pH, but capsids can come apart as well. These are two electron micrographs that document what's going on. There's an adenovirus. Uh, moving along a microtubule. So that would correspond to the partially disassembled capsid. You actually can't tell it's partially disassembled in that EM. And here are some uh, adenoviruses docked onto the nuclear pore. So this is the nucleoplasm at the top of this image. Uh, there's the nuclear pores and the adenoviruses docked onto them. So let's talk about polio, another icosahedral <coughs> virus that we use as a model. In the case of polio, what happens is a pore opens up at one end of the capsid to let the RNA out. So polioviruses bind to cellular receptors at the cell surface. They're taken up by endocytosis. But it turns out that the receptor is enough to uncoat the particle. If you take purified poliovirus and purified receptor and mix them, the RNA comes out of the capsid. The receptor itself catalyzes the transition to metastability through the unstable state, I should say. So in, in the entry scheme, the virus binds a receptor. It undergoes a conformational transition as it's being taken up by endocytosis. Uh, and then the RNA passes out of the capsid into the endosome. And on the bottom here is a higher view uh, of this. It's really a hypothesis for which there's some good experimental support. So here is a picture of the capsid bound to two receptor molecules. They're binding in this groove around the fivefold axis of symmetry. And the interior, of course, is the RNA. It's not shown in this first panel. Upon um, binding the receptor, the virus capsid undergoes a conformational change such that the end terminus of, of one of the capsid proteins, which is called VP1, it's shown in blue here. This end terminus you could almost think of as a fusion peptide. It's highly hydrophobic. So it's buried on the inside of the capsid. And when the virus binds its receptor, it, it comes out. It flips around because apparently the receptor sitting in the capsid makes major conformational changes. So the end terminus of VP1 shoots outside and inserts into the membrane, just like a fusion peptide, except multiple copies, maybe five, make a pore in the membrane. And at the same time, the five-fold axis may be opening up. Uh, and the, and the RNA can then come out. The RNA is the green molecule with the protein at the end of it. Whether this happens at the five-fold axis isn't clear or not. It may happen somewhere else. But the key here is that there's a receptor-induced conformational change that puts the end terminus of VP1 uh, outside of the particle 
and make a pore. So again, fusion is regulated, so it doesn't happen, not really fusion, of course. Pore formation is regulated, so it doesn't happen everywhere by hiding the N-terminus of VP1 and requiring interaction with the cell receptor to get that N-terminus outside of the virus particle. Very, very clever evolutionary tricks, I think. All right, now, another detail here which is really interesting. If you go back to the first panel on the bottom left here, which shows the virus initially bound to two receptor molecules, um, in, the, in the virus itself, you can see this kind of a gray, grayish, blackish molecule just below where the receptor is binding. <coughs> this is actually a lipid that is present in the virus. So if you grow polioviruses in cells, they will have this lipid in them. It's thought to be a stabilizer. And when the receptor binds to the capsid, it forces the lipid out. And now the capsid has room to move, if you will. There are big spaces in here. And we think that allows the proteins to move around, the N-terminus of VP1 to come out, and a pore to open up. So that lipid is a really key regulator of uncoding. There are some antiviral drugs that were designed many years ago that turned out to work by replacing the lipid in the capsid. So here is a diagram of the, the capsid, five-fold axis. Uh, here's receptor binding. This happens to be rhinovirus, but it applies for polio as well. And there's a little uh, tunnel at the base of the receptor binding site, and that's where the lipid is present in the previous slide. And there's an antiviral drug. It's a series of antiviral compounds that actually bind very tightly in that pore below the receptor binding site. They replace the lipid. They bind so tightly they don't come out. They have high affinity interactions, and they make it impossible for the virus to release its genome. So these are uncoding inhibitors. And these, these don't have much clinical use. They're not terribly effective clinically for common colds, say, which are caused by rhinoviruses. And that you get resistance very readily. It's easy to get a, a one amino acid change uh, on the residues lining this pocket, and then the drug doesn't bind anymore. But they have been useful for elucidating the encoding process. And these were what, what were key to us understanding what's going on. Uh, on the right is a three-dimensional structure of poliovirus bound to one of these drugs bound in the pocket. And you can see the, the, the uh, yellow molecules there. There's five around each five-fold axis of symmetry. So uh, considering icosahedral symmetry, how many of these drug molecules would bind a single virus particle? <coughs> how many five-fold axes are there? Do you remember? You don't remember? I'm so sad. 12. There are 12 five. That's an icosahedron. An icosahedron has 12 five-fold axes. You should know that before the exam. And so there are five copies of the drug around each five-fold axis, so there would be 60. And that's the why icosahedral symmetry is so beautiful. You can predict all of these things. I want to talk a little bit about uh, a few other aspects of entry. Uh, we talked about how HIV uses two receptors, a receptor and a co-receptor, and why to trigger fusion. Um, and there's another example of that which is really interesting, and that's Coxsackie virus, which I showed you the sign of earlier in this, in this lecture. It also requires two receptors, um, DAF and CAR. CAR is the Coxsackie adenoreceptor shared with adenovirus. Uh, these viruses, Coxsackie viruses, initiate infection at mucosal surfaces, at respiratory epithelium or gut epithelium. Uh, and but the problem is CAR, which is one of the uh, receptors that it needs, uh, it's shown here engaging adenovirus, is present in the spaces between the cells. So this is a typical stratified columnar epithelial surface. It could be your respiratory tract. And these Coxsackie viruses infect here. One of the receptors, DAF, is at the surface, but the other one is buried in here. So how does the virus get to it? Because it's essential for infection. And you can't, uh, if you don't have it available, the virus will not infect. So the key is that the first binding allows access to the second receptor. And it's shown on this slide. So here is a diagram of the same <coughs> epithelial sheet. Here's the, the brush border at the top. And there's, there's DAF, yeah. which is present at the apical surface of these cells. Coxsackie virus is shown in green can bind DAF. But look. CAR is present in the tight junctions. There's no way that the virus can get at that. We know that from experiments. When the virus binds DAF, this starts a signal transduction pathway. A few protein kinases are shown here. 
The point is it ends up loosening the actin filaments that are just below the plasma membrane. It's very tight and it's not easy for proteins to move in the membrane with that tight actin substructure. But the binding of the virus to DAF causes signaling that loosens it up. The virus can now move in it to the tight junctions. This signaling pathway extends to the tight junction. It also loosens up the junction so the virus can move in and <coughs> bind to CAR and infect cells. So that's why you need two receptors in this case because the first one is needed to loosen up the junctions so that uh, the virus can get into its actual uptake receptor, which is CAR. So DAF is not endocytosed. The virus just remains bound to it, but rather it transduces signals that allows the virus to reach the CAR. So a really cool example of how you need two receptors. Another interesting entry strategy is shown by real viruses. These are viruses with double-stranded RNA. They have two concentric icosahedral shells, very stable. How do they become unstable? What triggers metastability? So here's the real virus on the upper left. The two shells are in different colors. The purple is the outer shell and the light color is the inner shell and there's the double-stranded RNA inside. These viruses of course bind receptors on the cell surface. They are taken up uh, by endocytosis. As the endosome moves towards the interior it becomes acidified and at some point it will fuse with a lysosome. Lysosomes contain digestive enzymes, proteases and nucleases and other things. They're meant to release ligands from receptors during normal cell processes. And most viruses get out of the endosome before the lysosome fuses with it. They don't want to be digested. But real virus stays there. It wants to be digested. It wants its outer shell to be digested away by the enzymes that are present in the lysosome. It's just amazing. So as the endosome moves in, fuses with the lysosome, the outer shell is digested away. So that outer protective cell, which the virus needs to be protected in the gut and moving around in stool and feces from organism to organism, it's digested away in the cell uh, and it's digested all the way down to the core, which is the inner shell with these turrets sticking out at each five-fold axis. That's what those green structures are. And that is highly hydrophobic, can poke its way out of the uh, endosome and ends up in the cytoplasm. Okay, so the way you make this virus unstable is by stripping off the outer shell, which can only happen in the lysosome. And from there, the virus can get out into the cytoplasm. Now, one more interesting twist to this story. So if I ever ask you, do nucleic acids have to, do nucleic acids always get out of the particle? This is one example where they don't. The, uh, the viral double-stranded RNAs are in this core. They never leave. They stay in the core. And mRNAs are made in the core by an RNA polymerase that's in there. And the uh, mRNAs that are made come out. They come out in the five-fold axis in these turrets. There's actually a, a tunnel from the interior to the exterior. The mRNAs come out. And those mRNAs then catalyze the synthesis of proteins and new virus particles eventually. So really, two really neat tricks here having the lysosomal enzymes take off the outer core, and then the fact that the genome never gets out of this particle. It's very happy to be in there because mRNAs can be made and they can come out, and they're enough to start uh, an infectious cycle. Let's summarize some of this. We've looked at entry mechanisms at the cell surface. Fusion is regulated by receptor interactions at that point. You don't need low pH at the cell surface. When you invoke the endocytic pathway, uh, low pH is often a catalyst, but together with other issues, with cleavage of fusion proteins, uh, with docking to a receptor, and of course for um, real viruses, the need for lysosomal enzymes. And don't forget that motor proteins uh, are transporting the viruses and the endosomes containing virus particles throughout the cell. They don't just diffuse around. Now for many viruses, the cell cytoplasm is the destination uh, for, especially for viruses with plus-stranded RNAs, they can be translated directly in the cytoplasm. But a lot of DNA viruses and influenza viruses need to get in the nucleus. So let's end up by just considering how that works. Nucleus, as you know, uh, has, has a membrane around it, which is impermeable to large particles. Viruses, in most cases, cannot get in, and they cannot pass through the membrane for sure. But there are nuclear pores that are 
machines that help export and import material upon the right signals, and viruses uh, gain access to the nucleus by those. And we're looking at four different situations here of nuclear entry. The first is on the left is influenza virus. We talked about how this virus is uncoated by low pH, and the, the viral uh, helical nucleocapsids uh, then are released from the particle. They can get in to the nucleus. They're small enough to pass through the nuclear pore. To get into the nucleus through the nuclear pore, you have to have a nuclear import signal. And this is something that proteins have. And if an RNA wants to get into the nucleus, it needs to be complexed with a protein that has a nuclear import signal. And so uh, the influenza virus RNAs are not naked. They're complexed with a protein, and that protein has a nuclear import signal. So that can simply be imported into the nucleus and start replicating. But not all viruses can simply pass through the pore. Uh, some of them are too big, shown in the next two panels. In panel B is a herpes virus that's docked onto the nuclear pore. Now, herpes virus has a big capsid in which the DNA is located, but around it is a membrane. When this virus membrane fuses with the cell, the capsid is left. The capsid makes its way down to the nuclear pore. And I don't know if you remember or not, but this capsid is unusual because one of the five-fold axes has a portal through which the DNA can come out. And so these capsids dock onto the pore with a portal directed into the, the opening of the pore, and the DNA can then come out. We don't know what the signals are yet, but that's how it works through that portal. So the capsid doesn't have to be disassembled. The next panel is disassembly of, is uncoating of adenovirus into the nucleus. We talked about how the virus comes in through endocytosis. It's partially disassembled. Viral proteins present in the capsid are released at low pH. These poke a hole in the endosome, and then the particle gets out. And then eventually it docks onto the nuclear pore, and the DNA gets in. In the next slide, I'm going to show you how we think that happens. It's a pretty unique mechanism. And finally, the smallest viruses, the parvoviruses, the circoviruses with tiny genomes and very small particles, they can actually pass through the nuclear pore. So the whole particle goes in, and in the nucleus, the DNA is released. We don't know what the signal is for that, but it's quite clear that these particles can end up in the nucleus. So uh, most DNA viruses, the DNA needs to end up in the nucleus. There's one exception among our viruses, the pox viruses, which stay in the cytoplasm. And among the RNA viruses, just a few want to go to the nucleus. Influenza virus is one of them. Right, so this is how we think that adenovirus is, is fully disassembled so that the DNA can pass into the nucleus. Remember, it's, it's brought to the nuclear pore uh, by motoring along uh, the microtubule by dynein. So dynein motors bring things from the cell periphery to the nucleus on microtubules. Kinesin motors brings stuff in the opposite direction. So it's a two-way railway, motors bringing in one direction and the other. So this is a partially disassembled adenovirus capsid. It's brought down to the nuclear pore. And then there it interacts with uh, some of the proteins and sits quite tightly on the nuclear pore. At the same time, what happens is the kinesin motor uh, interacts with the adenovirus capsid and starts pulling it the other way. Okay. So that breaks the capsid apart. And there's really good experimental evidence for this. So there's, there's viral capsid proteins that specifically interact both with dynein and kinesin motors. And we think uh, this is a process of ripping apart the capsid so that the DNA is released and it can get in the cell. Now, maybe this is a little too humanized for reality because, you know, we have certain data that suggests that this is happening. But, you know, the, the idea of a Pulling at in both directions is very appealing to explain uncoating a particle, but I think it may be a little too humanized to be true. It's people f thinking fancifully, and I'm not sure that viruses uh, do that. But anyway, it's an interesting <coughs> hypothesis.